I was having a hard time deciding what I was going to talk about tonight, but I decided I was just going to tell a story that's very personal to me, and so I need to make sure I check my watch, make sure I don't go over time. Uh, but I want to tell you that my parents, as it turns out, were trailblazers. Uh, my father is African American, and my mother is white. My dad and mom got married on October 23rd, 1971. What makes them trailblazers is that until 1967, it was illegal for blacks and whites to marry in 16 southern states. It was actually illegal for blacks and whites to marry in Nebraska until 1963. So my parents got married on October 23rd, 1971. I was born in 72. You can probably figure out why they got married. <laughs> because of their strong and enduring love. Um, so my father is from a, a small town in rural Mississippi called Centerville. Uh, my dad is, well, he was 83 years old until November. He found out he's actually 84. He got his, a copy of his actual birth certificate, and it turns out he was born in 31 and not 32. And all of a sudden, he looks older now, too. He just looks older. Uh, but he's from a, he, was, he grew up in the segregated South. So Mississippi was one of the most segregated uh, states in the Union. So my dad grew up in the era of separate drinking fountains. Uh, if a white man was on the sidewalk, he'd have to get off. He grew up in the segregated schools. Um, in fact, my father, when he was 15 years old, had actually made a threat to a white neighbor. He was talking to old man Johnson who lived next door, and I refer to him old man Johnson very affectionately. That's what they called him, old man Johnson. And uh, he, Mr. Johnson's cattle used to come over onto my dad's family's farm and eat, his, eat their crops. And my dad told him one day, if your cattle eat my crops again, I'm gonna shoot them. His mom could see him talking to Mr. Johnson out the kitchen window, and she called him in and she said, uh, what were you saying to Mr. Johnson? And he said, uh, I told Mr. Johnson if his cattle eat our crops again, I was gonna shoot him. My grandma said, boy, you have no sense. And she put him on a bus and sent him two and a half hours away to another town in Mississippi. He didn't stay another night in Centerville, Mississippi. Because at that time, a black man who makes a threat like that to a white man is hanging from a tree or in the bottom of a river. In fact, my dad used to fish with Megra Evers. He used to always tell me that. I didn't believe him. In fact, when he told me what he said to the old white man, I didn't really believe that story either. But I have two great aunts. Uh, great. Now, if I didn't tell you where, I was, where my dad was from, when I tell you my aunt's names, you would guess where they're from. Uh, Beulah and Willie Pearl my two, <laughs> are my two great aunts. And, and uh, so I asked them about the story about my father making a threat to the old white man. And they said, yeah, your, your, your dad was something else. So my dad used to fish with Megra Evers. He also lived um, 20 minutes away from Money, Mississippi when Emmett Till was killed. If you don't know the story of Emmett Till, Emmett Till was the 14-year-old boy from Chicago, African-American boy who was visiting his grandfather. And the story says that he whistled at a, um, a white woman. And uh, three days later, they came and took him out of his grandfather's, grandfather's house and beat him, shot him, put a gin reel around his neck and threw him in the river. His mom insisted on an open casket. Some say that really started the Civil Rights Movement, even more so than Rosa Parks choosing not to get out of her seat. So my father's from rural Mississippi, and uh, my mom's just a plain old white person, just a plain old white lady. <laughs> it, it, nothing super significant, just plain old white lady. I don't have any great stories to tell you about my mom. And just that. Yeah, she's just, just a white lady. I love her a lot, though. My mom's great. Um, so even though the law had changed, not everybody was real excited about white people and black people marrying, including my mom's parents, my uh, biological maternal grandparents were not, not real excited about my mom marrying my father. And they lived, I'm from Lincoln, I grew up, I consider 3129 Dudley my home. That's where I'm, my parents lived for the first 22 years of my life. And so my biological maternal grandparents lived in Lincoln until I was in my late 20s, uh, but I never met them. I never met my biological maternal grandparents even though we were lived in the same city. So if I had been standing behind him at Super Saver, I wouldn't have known that I was standing behind my biological maternal grandparents. They had a really strong prejudice about black people, and uh, so they didn't approve of my mother marrying my father. In fact, I didn't learn, I learned a lot of my parents' stories later in life. My parents actually got married in Marysville, Kansas. Uh, in some ways, they were trying to keep it a secret that they were getting married. Um, so I never met my biological maternal grandparents, and as a, as a result, and I had told that story a lot, and I didn't realize until I was much older that, as a result, I had a really strong 
prejudice against a certain demographic of people. I had a really strong prejudice against old white people. <laughs> I, I say that with humblest regards, knowing that there's a few old white people in the room. Um, I'll, I'll tell you more about that here in just a second. Uh, but I had this really strong prejudice against old, old white people. And it was based on what a lot of prejudice is based on. It was based on fear. It made perfectly good sense to me until I was too old to tell you. Because um, if my biological maternal grandparents didn't like me because I was black, how much more the old white person on the street? And so uh, I left Lincoln High. I graduated from Lincoln High class of 90 and went to uh, what I think, like to think of as the Harvard of the Midwest, Nebraska Wesleyan University. Uh, <laughs> And while I was there, I found out I have an allergy, a really rare allergy to alcohol. I, I can't drink alcohol. It puts me in a coma. So I turned 21, had a, had a beer. This is really another story, but I had a beer and a few drinks and ended up in a coma-like state for 10 days. And so I don't, I don't drink because I don't have that kind of vacation time. <laughs> I, don't, I, kind of, I don't have that much built up yet. Just started a new job. Um, and so... Um, it messed up my financial aid, and so when I um, was going to go back to Wesleyan, it, I, it was, my financial aid package was all messed up, so I thought, well, maybe I'll transfer to university. And uh, the financial aid guy said, don't do that. We have a, a donor who loves to support good students. And so I said, great. He came back to me and said, your, your tuition for next, next year is covered. Awesome. This is great. Uh, only two requirements. One, you have to keep your GPO, GPA above a 3.0. <clears throat> and I had a 3.8. I'm not bragging, I'm, I'm just smart. And so, um, so and, and then you have to meet her for lunch. And I was like, great, that's, that's, that's really too easy. Tell me, tell me about this, this person. So she said, well, well, she's 84. And so in my mind, I was like, I still have this prejudice against old white people, remember? Um, so I'm, I'm assuming she's white. And, uh, and he says, you just, get, and I said, okay, she's 84. That makes me nervous. And then, uh, and I said, well, where will we have lunch? And he said, we're gonna go to Gateway Manor and meet her because she's living at Gateway Manor. Her name was Thora. And so I thought, okay, not only is she an old white person, but we have to go somewhere it's going to be a whole bunch more old white people. <laughs> and so I was nervous. I, I was really embarrassed and nervous because I thought if my grandparents didn't like me because I was, I was black, how much more this, this old lady? And actually I had a dream three days before I went that when I walked into the Gateway Manor, she sees me and she goes, oh, hell no. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not giving my money to one of them. Uh, but I went anyway because I, I needed the money. And so, uh, it, as it turns out, and that, this is how it often works, um, as it turns out, me and Thora hit it off. Thora had been a principal in Oakland, California, had been around diversity her entire life. She was an amazing, phenomenal, feisty, tough woman, and, and my life is better because cause she was in it. And so, we met that first time, and we, over, we had a great lunch over the, the ham loaf. Uh, <laughs> The ham loaf and the jello with the fruit in it, that just is horrible. Uh, but we, had a, we hit it off after that first visit. And I decided, you know, I would just call her up and go see her because she was so cool. And I was planning to be a teacher. And I just was learning so much from her. I just liked her so much. And so after about the third visit, I decided I needed to tell her my story. So I said, though, I got to tell you, I was really scared to meet you. Uh, my grandparents didn't like me, don't like me. And my grandparents were still living at the time. And I said, I've never met them. They live in Lincoln. Uh, they didn't approve of my mother marrying my father, so I, I've never met him. And so I, I thought you were going to feel the same way about me that my grandparents did. And she was very feisty, and she, she said, that's, that's foolishness. And um, then what she did is she, she took me by the hand, and she walked me around the cafeteria of the Gateway Manor and introduced me to all of her friends as her grandson. Aww. Now, I had never had anybody refer to me as her grandson because I hadn't yet been to meet my dad's side of the family in Mississippi. So I, I didn't know what an incredible term of endearment grandson was. And so I was getting emotional. Right? I was kind of tearing up as I was, let me check the time. Um, I, I was getting emotional as she's introducing me to her, her friends as her grandson. And my eyes were filling with tears. And, and then I started to watch their faces as they were, she was telling them <laughs> that this was her, her, black, <laughs> her black grandson. <laughs> And I could tell they were perplexed and confused. I could tell they were wondering, where the hell did he come from? <laughs> she has never, ever mentioned this Negro. Um, and so, so, and I'd watch it, I'd watch it many times, and she'd introduce me, and then they'd say, okay, we'll see you at bingo. Um, <laughs> but what happened at that moment, I, I realized that, that um, yes, my grandparents had hurt me. Uh, you know, they never came to watch any of my football games. I know our team sucks, 
when I played at Lincoln High, but they could have still came and cheered. No fishing trips with my grandfather, no birthdays, no baseball games. I didn't have any of that with my grandparents, even though we lived in the same city. Um, and so I had this really strong prejudice against old white people. What Thora taught me is that, uh, yes, my grandparents felt that way, but not all old white people did. And I think that's a lesson we can all apply to our lives when we think about um, people we have bias against and people we're missing out on relationships with because we have this fear or this uh, prejudice about who they are and, and how they think. And so I'm so glad that Thora was in my life. I'm a better person because Thora was in my life. She believed in me. She uh, continued to fund my, the rest of my education and she really wanted to pay for my master's degree. My one regret is that she died mad at me because she really wanted me to continue to go on to get my master's degree. So um, that's my story. Um, and I don't know if you've had your Thora story yet. Uh, I don't know who you need your Thora to be in your life, but I hope at some point, some point soon, you, you have your Thora story. Thank you.